Um, good afternoon. And we've kind of taken the, the view that when we talk about connection in a city, it's not only about um, transport or movement, it's also about the connections back to history, social, and that kind of identifying with place. So how do I get this going? So I'm going to show two projects that we've worked on to, with Brookfield, one in London and one in Sydney. The one in London came first and was our introduction to Brookfield. And when we're looking at constraints or what drives a, a project in London, the wonderful and the sometimes frustrating piece is that there, there isn't a wealth of FSR maximum floor ratios, certain setbacks. It's all predominantly based on merit, but also based on views of St. Paul's. So this was one of the views which was key to the design of London Wall Place. There is a place in Richmond Park where you get this wonderful manicured view, and at the end you can see St. Paul's many miles away. And this has a direct bearing on your design of the building to keep and protect these views. And that's, they're frustrating, but they're somehow quite beautiful as well, where you can keep those, those areas. Now, this is a slide from a view of Rome and London, and you can just see that red line there. That was the site of London Wall Place. And you say, why is this coming up here? But actually, the arrangement of the city in the Roman times has a direct relationship on our final proposal and in the city in general. So this is a view of London and part of London we were looking at in the city in the 1500s. And you can still see the wall kind of snaking around there, and the site sits across there, and it's, so part of it sits within and without. There's also that kind of duality that's fun. And you're going, okay, I can still see the Roman walls, and I can still see the street divisions that they've been filling in. Um, this was in the 1700s. It fills out really quickly, but what starts to happen is the elements of the wall and the, and the Roman settlement start to get built into the buildings. But the street pattern remains the same, and the city kind of grows around it. And that's the joy of London, this kind of unpredictability and mesh of styles. Uh, but this happened, obviously, during the Blitz. When you had 1940s, you had the destruction of this part of London. So when you look up there, you see the, the lines of the streets, the lines of the buildings, but everything's gone. And it was this kind of sense of destruction. Now, in some areas, areas were rebuilt, in others, less so. And here, on this site, this was planned for London Wall, and there's this utopian vision post-Second World War where cars were going to have free reign at street level, and people were going to be walking in these elevated walkways, free from the fumes, having a kind of a glorious life up there. But pff, didn't all quite work out quite like that in London. So this is what we ended up with with the site. This is looking down one of the side streets. This is just on the outside of the Roman wall. You've got fragments of the old city there. You've got fragments of some of the 1960s and then some newer developments. But it was something which was cutting people off. People were forced to go up, or more often people were just walking in the motorways which were founded around the site. This is the line of the wall that ran through the site. And we just thought this has to be the key indicator of how we rebuild and how we try and connect back to what was happening before the, the, the wholesale destruction in the 40s and then the 1950s city planning. And then when we looked at the wall, naively we were imagining the wall there was a Roman wall. But then we started to look at it and think, why are all those different materials, different forms. And then when we looked at it, we realized that just the base was, was Roman. And then above there, you had different bits added over the years as different, different buildings were engaged with it. But my favorite is right at the top, where there was a pieces removed by the Victorians who wanted to make it feel more ruin-like. And so they put these fake castellations in there. But sometimes it's that kind of the loss or the the absence there, which also has a, has a resonance. So what we had with the site were these kind of fragments, which had also been um, knocked down in the 60s to make them more picturesque again and to allow the realignment of the motorway. And also these kind of layering of 70s and 60s and 50s buildings. And it's that layering as well that you get in London and in other cities which gives you that joy so that when we, can the next slide please? 
when we put London Wall through that and put the, the original alignment, suddenly all these other artifacts made sense. And when you look down some of the, the is that me or is that you? I don't know. Down the, <laughs> down the streets of London, you get these canyons, and at the end we had the site of the tower which we were demolishing. And then when we went across the site, we discovered there were up to six meters in height difference between all of the different spaces on the site. And what we didn't want to do was just create, oh, let's just try and blanket it all out. And I personally love the way that you went from the kind of the 80s street level, then you had the street level just before the war, because then when everything, when all the buildings were demolished, everything was cleared down and made to the same height. So all the street levels went up. Then you had the Roman wall, Roman level of the city. But then you also had the elevation of the city sort of in the 60s and 70s with all the different walkways. And then how can we connect out? We were discussing beforehand about what makes good public space around buildings. And I think very often you think of your favorite spaces, and they're not necessarily always the, the most famous or the grandest spaces. It can be some of those places of smaller scale and how we can start to engender that in our projects. So this was a, a render when we were just in the pre-planning stage of how some of the spaces around the two buildings, new series of gardens that we connected through there, because the whole basis of the scheme was to bring people back to street level. And that doesn't mean one level. There's lots of different levels in there because we've also kept a memory of a functioning walkway through the site, because these are still used by people in London. So these snaking elements become places to wander, to stop. And the key part of this scheme was not making one low building, it was actually opening up and creating two buildings either side of new public spaces. This is two elements which cantilever from either end of the building, counting out, and this is the area where you have the old, the 60s, with the core 10 reimagined against this new element, built buildings behind, and then the old original towers on back of the city. Now, how do we link the materiality back? Now, on that building there, it has napped flint. Napped flint is the base building material of all the buildings in the area. You have this kind of very thin, shell and then when you break in you've got all this kind of glorious iridescent coloring inside so we sought to kind of mimic or hark back to that form in our materials so the inside of the flint is with this ceramic faience tile which took us a year to get the just the correct tone and then the white concrete shells so the form of it varies from being big windows to the city to being much smaller finer grain when you're looking down London Wall. And again, those ceilings run underneath to create these soffits to the spaces. And then with all these different faces, some to the city, some to the street, and some to the Barbican, we wanted to sort of play up and have different attributes. So this is the building as can see. It's now nearly finished. We're in the final pieces of snagging. But you can see we pulled two buildings apart, get the view through, and this connected um, a link from the north, from Shoreditch, down to the south of the river in Elephant and Castle, and now allows you to walk in a continuous line between north and south of the river, which, as some of you will know, is, is quite a divide. Now, at the same time we were working on these designs, we were invited to the design competition for Wynyard. And this is the, the kind of the block of ice that we were given. Now, in Sydney, of course, you have the merit base through the design competitions, and then you also have a very restrictive form of um, land that you're allowed to build. So we were kind of taking these, and I'm not going to spend time now talking about how we responded to that with these different forms to try and give the illusion of height, to try and unify. More that when we look at the city, Again, it's all of those kind of rolling topographies, which mean that you're always given these views that you're completely unexpected in the city. But also George Street. George Street has this, this kind of red line through the city where everything can connect into and how we can explore that. Now, when we first came, this is how George Street looked. It's obviously been cleared now and is still full of big vehicles, but is in the process of transition. And this is a slide that Carl 
um, first introduced me to here of this of George Street as it was before when there were um, trams running up and down and there will be again but this has something I think we all respond to because it has a more human scale and a place to stop and then we we're also walking around the city and seeing things like Shell House these views which have been lost many views now because we're looking down but also we're not we're not looking up and looking at the city how can we engender that and this fine grain with the laneways they're, they're such a great resource and they cut through and the small businesses that start to open there we're in that beginning phase i think now in sydney so to when you park past the biggest asset in the center the city center that isn't really being utilized this is a view when it all starts to make sense before the 1980s edition so you just get this smoothed out park and the trees planted there the trees that are still the same trees that exist today all around there obviously the 80s elevated it with the, the dome and we had the menzies hotel coming in i think as many of you will have seen that is now gone so demolition is complete and we will soon be coming up and there's, there's something about that absence has made Shell House come back to the fore. Many people sort of tell me, and I know the rest of our office, and I know it's from myself, when you're seeing it, Shell House, you're able to fully appreciate the beauty of it now, and also appreciate the kind of transformational effect when George Street will have the new hall all the way through to Carrington, and the way it will start to open up this part of the city. Again, this is long gone now, but it can be a little bit nostalgic for Windstop and uh, the kind of the spaces of Wynyard. We're keeping all the, the routes, the Hunter Connection, all the routes through to the station from George and then also Wynyard Lane, and trying to bring some of the kind of drama and theater of, of the station. So rather than that, we're looking more in that kind of New York model where you can enjoy going to those spaces, where you feel good coming out of those spaces, not in that kind of current rat run when you go out previously past Wynyard and down to the Hunter. And this was possible by connecting into the wider context. Before, in, in Sydney, you've got some beautiful examples of where the tower sits proud on its own. We wanted to lock it into the city, so we created the building right to the edge and created this big urban space, an urban room that ran through the middle of the site, connecting. And that was possible through our work with the engineers who were staying up late with us to make the sides buildings, the, the party walls, all taking the load down and utilizing the, the um, flying buttresses concept to take the loads out so we're able to create this large hall under which we could somehow navigate and make the spaces work. So this is the new hall. In there, we've got all these different vitrines for retail and for office lobbies, which have been constantly changing as we've been working with the incoming tenants. But at the heart of it is the lift core, because very often on these developments, there seem so many competing, competing constraints where people want to go and transport, want to go in a straight line, a core goes down in the middle, and how we can make some of those constraints into something unique, having a real sense of place, but then also allowing it to evolve so that where this was where we were, say, a year ago, when we had, you can see the views through to Gwynyard, this is standing in George Street, the light rail coming to the side, and then the retail boxes. We've now been working with with NAB so we can start to occupy those upper levels, start to increase it, start to have activation, but still keep all the inherent components as they are. And this is something which addresses um, George Street with retail and with the, with the transport. But we wanted to make it something where people will feel proud about their railway stations again. And over onto Carrington, where you can start to bring Shell House back to what it would be when in the early pictures, even as far as the 60s, Shell House clock was still easily visible as you came in on the ferry into Circular Quay. So how that can be lit and brought back into the consciousness of people in the city, when really this area was one of the most um, sought after parts with the opening of the Harbour Bridge, with York Street becoming a real hub here with the Shell House Tower brought back there and brought back again into what we'll be talking about and what we'll be building.